What's going on, everybody? Welcome on in to the Matt Lombardo Show presented by Heavy Sports. Big show in front of us. We're now less than a week away from the NFL trade deadline. All of the rumors, all of the speculation coming to a head. Some big deals like the Christian McCaffrey blockbuster to the San Francisco 49ers have already been made. Some more trades undoubtedly coming down the pike. We'll be joined by former NFL general manager of the Philadelphia Eagles and the Cleveland Browns, Joe Banner of the 33rd team, to get his thoughts on the teams that should be making moves, who should be standing pat, the teams that are best positioned for long-term success, and a whole lot more. We'll also get into some of the biggest performances of the past week across the NFL. Man, there's some bad football being played across this league, but some real standout performances as well. We'll give out the Lombardo Trophy and make our pick of the week. And as always, if you enjoy the podcast, please go ahead and subscribe in the Apple Podcast Store, Spotify, SoundCloud, all of your favorite podcast platforms. Check us out on YouTube. And if you really enjoy the conversation and the guests and the analysis, it would mean a lot if you go ahead and leave a five-star review in the Apple Podcast Store. It really helps grow the show. Let us know who you'd like to have on the podcast, and we'll go and get them on. Joining us, former Philadelphia Eagles and Cleveland Browns executive, currently of the 33rd team. You can follow him on Twitter, at Joe Banner 13 Joe Banner joins us here on the Matt Lombardo Show. Joe, thanks for taking the time today. How you doing, man? My pleasure. Good to be on with you, Matt. And it's great to see you. And, you know, I just want to start out with a team that you're pretty familiar with, the Philadelphia Eagles, because when you look at Howie Roseman and what they've built right now, they have two first-round picks. What would you be doing? What should they be doing as the tr trade deadline approaches? A and if you think they should be buyers, I don't see a lot of holes on this roster. Where do you think that they would need to upgrade? Yeah, I think you got it at the end. I mean, I worry a little bit about the depth on the offensive line. They've got five guys there that have a history of being hurt, even though they're all really good players. And when healthy, that may be top three offensive line of football. But I'm not sure where else I'd go. Maybe a little depth, but Frankly, offensive line aren't available this time of year. And, you know, they got a good stash of draft picks to have a chance to sustain the success. I, I probably would be making some calls to check, but I'd probably not end up doing a whole lot. Yeah, and you mentioned the draft picks, the two first-round picks, especially with how Jalen Hurts has really developed into an MVP caliber quarterback this year. They've built in a lot of optionality there. You think about having the quarterback long-term, most likely, the cap space in the future, the multiple first-round picks. Are they kind of the gold standard at this point? I know that line got thrown around by, by your former boss, Jeffrey Lurie. But have they reached that level at this point with what they've built and the optionality they now have? I just want you to know my blood pressure immediately escalates when I hear that uh, phrase. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a long history. Um, listen, I think they're one of the relatively small group of teams that really seem to understand how you separate yourself from the pack and uh, they stick to what they believe in. They don't rationalize, they don't deviate. And, uh, you know, they do believe every team in the league will tell you they'd love to have a great quarterback. But if you watch what they do, not every team acts as if they have to have a great quarterback to succeed. But the Eagles do. And even though Wentz didn't work out, they did win a Super Bowl with them. They were able to convert it to some draft picks when time ran out. You know, they took a shot on Hertz, and that's worked out. But they made this trade with the Saints. I don't really care if they say otherwise, to make sure that if Hertz didn't work out, they had the ammunition and a chance to go after one of the top quarterbacks in this draft. The other thing they've done is they've prioritized their lines, know that if you have a good quarterback and you can dominate the lines, you're already going to be a good team. Now, you got to do a few more things to get to great. Uh, they put a good emphasis on things like character and intelligence, which I think matter more than many people realize. Uh, and they've got a long-term plan. They're not all in in any given year. They're trying to run it in a way that it's not going to be a big roller coaster ride of ups and downs. And you know, I think every team in the league should be copying that model. And frankly, there's only about six or eight teams that consistently have real conviction and, and stick to it and, and have a smart conviction, which is what they have. I'm not even sure when you look at the landscape of the NFC at this point, I'm not sure who that other team would be, especially Green Bay has kind of found struggles in terms of trying to keep things building around Aaron Rodgers. The clock might be running out on Tampa Bay. I guess maybe you can make a case for Dallas, but that doesn't seem to really consistently ever work out. It just seems like they've positioned themselves to be that team to beat in that conference for some time. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to come up with a name. Honestly, a few weeks ago, I was saying San Francisco. I right. still think they have a chance to get it together, but that doesn't look as like a good an insight as I thought it was when I was saying it. You know, Garoppolo 
to somebody I've always thought was just average, but thought with the quality of the people around him and the quality of Kyle Shanahan as an offensive coach, that they would still have success. Now that may come together. It's early to kind of think that the way things are at the moment is the way going to finish. But as we sit here today, you know, unless somebody like the 49ers jumps up and starts playing like their talent should allow them to play, there's no name you can come up with. It's that's serious competition. Dallas is a possibility, but they just played a week ago, granted with Dallas's backup quarterback. And the Eagles look like the much better team. So I really put Dallas and San Francisco as the only two teams that I could see even emerging as we go forward here to possibly give them a serious run for their money. For sure. And you mentioned about them potentially being all in for the long term. Another team that is acting as if they're all in right now, they're really signaling it after their move on Monday night is the New York Jets. You lose Brees Hall, who looked like a runaway offensive rookie of the year candidate. He goes down with the ACL. They don't even waste 24 hours. They go get James Robinson in a trade. So are they for real? Can the Jets in the AFC make some sort of playoff push? Because they're certainly acting like they're going to try to. Yeah, they're, they are acting like they're trying to make sure that they get the most out of this season they can. Honestly, I look at both New York teams the same way. They're on the right track. They appear to have the right leadership in place, but they're not ready to be there yet. So I think we're going to see them come back to the pack a little bit. I still think they're going to end up with seasons they feel really good about and progress they feel really good about and their fans can be hopeful. Um, but I don't think we're going to see them continue at the pace they are. Uh, at least that's my view. I mean, I've been saying about the Giants for about five weeks and you know, they, they've rattled off a bunch of wins in a row. But I, I think that the progress they've made in both instances is compelling. I don't have any problem with what the Jets did. They gave up a fairly low pick. You know, the team is working really hard. The coaching staff's doing a good job. You want to reward them. You don't want to send the message. You're kind of throwing in the towel now. If they made another move in which they gave up some high picks, I would think that's premature for a season. And I still think, you know, probably good is the best that they can hope for. But to take a relatively low pick and, and uh, acquire somebody that I think can help you on the field and send the message to the organization and the players who are working so hard that you believe in them, I think there's real value in that. So I think it was a smart move. And, and it does show an aggressive mindset. And most teams that succeed and have sustained success have aggressive mindsets. So I think seeing both teams behave that way should provide people in New York who've been miserable for a very long time some legitimate hope going forward. It almost feels like this is the table setting year for those two teams, right? And you look yeah. at what's happening with the Giants and you brought up the aggressiveness. I'd argue that they are winning and they're six and one right now for really three reasons. Brian Dable has them all in because he's been so aggressive all year and they seem to really buy in on the culture and the wins are stacking. And we've talked about it on this show. The only way that you build culture is by stacking wins and they're doing that. They're using Saquon Barkley really smart in the fourth quarter when teams are tiring and they're playing great defense. But I really don't know what the Giants ceiling is because you look at the schedule, there's a real opportunity for them to make a run, but I can't wrap my head around this roster Winning double-digit games. It's its this very weird catch-22, Joe. So when you look at the Giants, what do you see for them? What's their ceiling in this particular year? Well, I see exactly what you see. And frankly, I would have thought it would have kicked in by now. I mean, I talked about the Eagles' philosophy. It goes back to when I was there, which means you need to dominate the lines of scrimmage. I mean, the defensive line is is good, although I still think it has some room to get to great. Their offensive line I actually view as a liability. So oh, for sure. that should translate into a team that does, you know, decently, but not great. But as you say, I mean, I think it's as conspicuous an example of how important coaching is in football as we've ever seen. I kind of combine that with the Saints, where the difference between Sean Payton being there and not is just such a massive difference. And to people that doubt it, just how huge an impact coaching has in the NFL. I just look at those as examples. They're hard to explain other than. In New Orleans, the change in coaching to something that doesn't look as strong. In New York, a change of coaching and GM to something that seems really strong. Way strong. By the way, the other yeah. team that I put in the same category, and I'm not just saying this because they won last night, is the Bears. They really went into the season and treated the office season like the only goal it had was to set themselves up for the future. Now they've went, managed to win a couple of games in the meantime, which is, as you say, good in changing the culture and the mindset. It helps you attract free agents in the offseason when they perceive you as a team that's on the upswing. Um, but those are the teams that if you look at the model of teams that have won and had sustained success, those three teams are copying that model right now. 
Now they got to continue to make smart decisions. They got to make good personnel decisions, but they're at least on the right track and they're trying to pursue the path that has led to the most significant turnarounds and sustained success. That's really interesting because I look at what they did and I think that they've really solidified their secondary, which are Quan Brisker and Kyler Gordon both had some pretty acrobatic interceptions on Monday night. But they have to do more to help Justin Fields, right? If, if they think that he's the guy and they didn't draft him, so maybe they don't think he's the guy. But I just like if they're going to take that step, isn't surrounding their quarterback with weapons that next step of that evolution? You know, so for me, I would say it differently. They, yes, they do need to support him. You know, I always argue the cliche, you know, a quarterback's best friend is a running game. I actually think the quarterback's best friend is a good offensive line because yeah. you need to be able to run and pass. And if okay. the offensive line is weak, it's hard to do either. So, you know, those people that are looking, you know, you follow Chicago media, they're very high on, you know, getting wide receivers. And to get to great, they're going to need to get some good wide receivers. And to truly evaluate him, they're going to need to get some better wide receivers. But for me, the first building block needs to be getting an offensive line uh, that's playing really well. Now, they drafted a guy in last year's draft that looks really good. They had a couple of guys left over that are solid. So I don't think they're that far from getting there, even though some plays it looks like it. But if I was running the Bears, my next priority would be getting an offensive line that allowed him to not only run the ball, but pass the ball and feel like he had protection and comfort in that, that pocket. That's when we'll really see him. And they have to accept he's not going to be the traditional pocket passing guy. I mean, the Eagles had to do this. We were talking about them a couple of minutes ago. And you, saw, and you saw that last night. You saw the, the touchdown run, a couple big scrambles. Yep. He's, he's going to – they have to give in to the reality that they have to play football a little bit the way the Eagles are. You're not giving up on the passing game, but you're treating the running game in a non-traditional way. I mean, when I was at the Eagles, we used to argue whether to call quarterback runs passing yardage or running yardage. It's for me, that's kind of a legitimate debate. Yeah. So if they look at fields and you look at like a Hertz, I actually think fields is a better thrower of the ball than Hertz. I think they both are wish they could process things just a little bit quicker. They're both incredible athletes. They've been go change the dynamic of your running attack in ways that very few players in the whole league can. So I think if they really capitulate to, you know, that mindset about how to play offensive football with that quarterback, I think he has a chance to succeed, and I don't think we'll know for sure until they take that mindset as opposed to at least early in the season. They seem to be trying to get him to play quarterback in kind of the old-fashioned way as opposed to the way these new mobile quarterbacks are playing. I think if they change that mindset, we'll at least give him a fair chance to prove one way or the other. And I think there's a reasonable chance he succeeds if they make that change. Oh, I do too. And I think that he has the arm strength, he has the ability, the accuracy. They just need to get him weapons to get him that better offensive line and play to his strengths. Like you said, you know, your other former team, I don't know what to make of their situation, the Cleveland Browns, because I don't know what they should be doing at the deadline. And should they be playing the long game and sell off some of these high priced pieces? Even with Deshaun Watson coming back and the division not really getting away from them, how do you see the Browns and where they should be going from here over the next seven days or so? Yeah, I mean, this is one of the closer calls in my mind, and it's for the reasons you gave. I mean, the division is still close, although the Bengals are really starting to play very well. I think the Steelers are in a deep hole and going to have a high draft pick. I think the Ravens' defense is going to hold them back and kind of cap you know, how, how good they can be. On the other hand, I find it really hard to see the Browns having a really good season, even with the expected improvement of the play they're going to get a quarterback. Uh, the only guy I'd probably think about moving just because I think this is probably the last year he's there and he may have some value is Clowney. And I'm not sure that they can acquire enough players fast enough to get them back kind of at the front of the pack in the division. I mean, I think they went backwards dramatically at center. Uh, when Treader retired, but the rest of the offensive line is good. Um, I think their wide receivers are, are pretty good. Their slot receiver is good. Their tight end, you know, very good. I mean, he's hurt at the moment, but very good. So running back obviously is excellent. I'm not sure there's a lot of players that they could go out and get it and improve. Now, if they could find a young center that somebody's willing to trade that could be part of the team for the next two to four years, I would do that in a second. I think their talent on defense is a little bit overrated, um, but – I also think you got some challenges with the defensive coordinator there in terms of beating, you know, really good teams against really good, smart offensive minds. So I don't really think there's anything they can do to keep the season from kind of ending up just okay. 
I don't think this yeah. season they have a chance to make a deep run in the playoffs. So I wouldn't uh, think it was smart for them to kind of sacrifice future either cap room or give up draft picks to see if there's some chance to salvage the back half of the season. I think they just got to kind of ride it out. And I think they got to focus on some additional defensive talent, possibly a center as well. And and then I think they have a better chance to compete with the better teams in the league. And you brought up kind of their struggles with great offensive minds. Matt LaFleur in Green Bay, I, I still think, even with their struggles, one of the brighter offensive-minded head coaches in the game. But what the heck? What is Green Bay's identity? What do they even do well right now? How do they turn that around? Because I know that Aaron Rodgers is frustrated and probably rightfully so with those wide receivers. But how do you fix that situation? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know that there's an answer to that. I mean, they, the three <laughs> elements of offense are your offensive line, your weapons, and your quarterback. Truthfully, Rodgers is not playing anywhere near as well as he has no. in the past. So I know it's kind of blasphemous to say that, but that's the truth. The offensive line is mediocre at best, and you know the wide receivers. Everybody's talked about that ad nauseum, so I won't bore them. Although they do appear to have some guys that I think, if given a little time, have a chance to put together a pretty good wide receiving core. But Rodgers just doesn't seem to have time. Yeah, well, he doesn't have time, and that, right. that's the root of the problem for me. Um, although, you know, he's got to convert some of the places where he has a chance. I mean, you know, you, you make $50 million a year, you have to make up for weaknesses on the team to warrant that kind of a salary. And they have weaknesses, but the expectation that he could overcome some of those weaknesses because he's so good has been true for many, many years. But at least how he's played the first seven games of this year, I don't think he's playing at the level where he can overcome the weaknesses of some other parts of the team. Who are the best wide receiver fits out there for them? Because you hear all the big names, Odell, Chase Claypool, all these guys. You know, if they're going to go shopping and think that they can run away from the rest of that division this year and make one final push with Aaron Rodgers, who would be the, the guys you're calling, whether it's agents for free agents or, or in a trade? Yeah. Listen, I may be stubborn on Judy because he hasn't been great, but I totally loved him in the draft. And I do think they should try to get somebody young enough that it isn't just kind of a one-year run with Rodgers, but actually start to put the wide receiver position the way you'd want it to be to really compete against good teams. So for me, Claypool and Judy are the kind of top two names. If there's any way they can get OBJ, you know, they should do that. But I suspect he wants to join a team that has a real chance to win a Super Bowl. He's going to play a small number of games, so he's not going to make a ton of money. Um, and they're sitting there three and four, you know, trailing the division by three games right now. So I don't know if he'd view them as a team that created an opportunity to probably go to the Super Bowl. Again, a couple of weeks ago, I would have said things differently. I would have thought he would find that as a desirable place and they should doing, be doing everything they can to get him. Now, if they're going to acquire a wide receiver, which I think makes sense, I favor one of the young guys that has a chance to be there for five, six years, maybe like a Judy or a Claypool, both of whom I think are good players. Judy's not showing it on the field, but I just feel like what we saw means in the right situation he could be. I still think Claypool has already demonstrated that he has the ability to be a really good receiver in this game. Not elite, but very good. Either one of those two dropping in with Dalbs and Watson, I think, could give you hope for the future at that position in Green Bay. And I know you're a big part of the 33rd team. I'm going to drill down and get your thoughts on what you guys are building there and how, what a special group that has turned into. But before that, the last one for me, Joe, is which team today, right now, across the entire NFL, both conferences, which team is built the best and best position to have long-term success? Not just maybe making a run at the Super Bowl this year, but with the widest window for the next several years to come. Yeah, I'm going to give you a tie of Buffalo and Kansas City. No, that's not a huge insight. That's a fairly obvious answer, but <laughs> it happens to be true. I mean, they've, they've drafted well. They've used their cap smart. The most important parts of the roster, they're in good shape and likely to stay so for a long time. They got very good coaching. Proud of both the guys who came through the Philly uh, organization and kind of mindset and, and way we did things, and they've replicated it. Um, I, I think those two teams are going to be at the – I mean, I predicted the beginning of the decade that we had. If you go back to the 80s, you know, the, four, the uh, Dallas won three Super Bowls. The 90s, the 49ers mm -hmm. won three Super Bowls. Actually, I may have that backwards, but anyway – uh, 2000, 2010, the Patriots dominated with multiple Super Bowls. I think the 2020s is going to end up being the, the Kansas City Chiefs with Andy Reid and Mahomes mm -hmm. as a team that will win two or three Super Bowls in this decade. Um, but the Bills are going to give them a run for their money. I mean, they're very, very smart. Both have dominant generational type quarterbacks, and they're really smart about not just evaluating players, but team building philosophies, which 
for me, those are two different things. I actually think it's what separated average GMs from great GMs. It's not just the grading of players. It's understanding the importance of a philosophy about building a team that maximizes your chances. And both of those teams have nailed that. And I wrote about this after that that last game in Arrowhead. It really seems like the Bills took another step in their evolution because they now have a defense that can complement that offense. And and the Von Miller addition to me, he's what they needed because he flicks a switch late in drives, late in games, and that switch goes from being a great defensive end to an elite one. They have really dominant secondary players. It just feels like in a rematch in Buffalo, I think that defense in, for the Bills is going to be the difference in that game. Yeah, and and if, I, if they were playing today, I would agree with that. The only thing I'm wondering is – if either of those teams gets OBJ and they both yeah. could use a third receiver, to me, they then become the favorite versus the other. And I usually don't, once you've got a good wide receiving core, I usually don't think of an addition like that making such a huge difference. But he, if, if healthy, and if he can play like he did at the end of last year and you add him to the existing weapons on either of those teams, I, I just can't even imagine what a defensive quarter is thinking as he looks at the tape and, how he even comes up with a game plan that he even thinks has a chance to slow them down. Forget stop them. That's off the table, but even slowing them down. I just, I just don't even know how you'd start to go about doing that. For sure. And OBJ's checklist, as we know, is play with an elite quarterback where you can catch a lot of balls and win a Super Bowl. Both of those teams would certainly check all of those boxes. Uh, Joe, tell me about the 33rd team, because you guys are building something really exciting and really unique in the content space. Um, just want to give you a chance to tell people what it's all about, what you have going over there. Yeah, and I appreciate the chance to talk about it. I mean, it's 33rd Team, 33rd Team.com. I'd love people to check it out. Basically, we've taken uh, all former head coaches, GMs, um, doctors, cap people um, who have actually been in the prime seats in some of the most successful franchises in the league and made the decisions. And they're our content providers. So you can hear from old iconic guys like Bill Parcells and Bill Cower. Um, we had two of our contributors and Dan Quinn and Doug Peterson, you know, have head coaching offers this last year. Dan decided to stay in Dallas. Doug took his, um, you know, we have the Chuck Park Paganos, Marty Morning Wigs, you know, Bill Polian, Rick Spielman. I mean, we have an array of names that people are familiar with. So instead of going the traditional road of, of reporters or pundits, by the way, we also have a significant group of former players. You can go right to the people that played the game, coached the game, sat in the room, made the decision about who to draft and who not to draft. And on an everyday basis, you know, get their analysis and, and contributions. I mean, yesterday we, we posted 28 articles and videos in one day. So you're getting that kind of analysis in detail. We also have a group of fantasy and betting guys who are off to a spectacular start in terms of the win rate on their recommendations. Um, so whatever your interest is in the game, and if you really want to hear from the people that have actually done it, made the decisions, um, you know, we, th we think we have a unique kind of approach to that uh, and welcome people kind of checking it out. No, I think it's a really smart play on your guys' part. And, and you know, I, I think there's nothing more valuable than hearing from the people who made the decisions. So we, that's how we base this podcast around current players, former executives, coaches, the whole gambit, because to me, that's the insight that's so hard to find. And you guys have kind of siloed it in one place with some big names, accomplished people like yourself, uh, like Dan Quinn, like Doug Peterson. And uh, I think you're building something special over there. I really do. Well, I appreciate you saying that. Hopefully people will check it out. It's a, a little different angle, uh, as we've said. And if you're looking for a lot of information and a place you can go back to multiple times and see different things posted all the time, uh, which is my complaint. Sometimes I will go on a site and I don't have to go back for two or three days because it's going to be basically the same. So we tried to correct that. So again, would love people to check it out and appreciate your calling some attention to it. He's Joe Banner, former executive of the Philadelphia Eagles and the Cleveland Browns, currently at the 33rd team. Check him out on Twitter at Joe Banner 13. Check out the 33rd team. And Joe, appreciate you taking the time. Look forward to talking to you further up the road, my friend. Sounds great, Matt. Enjoy. Great insight there, and especially when you talk about some of the teams at the top of the totem pole. You talk about the Philadelphia Eagles. You talk about the Buffalo Bills, the Kansas City Chiefs. To me, they're the cream of the crop, and, and that's no real groundbreaking analysis. But those are the teams that are going to be in the mix not only this year, not only this season, that you can look at as prohibitive Super Bowl favorites, 
But I think all three of those teams have done a really nice job of building rosters and building in optionality as far as building those rosters out even further of competing for championships over the next several years. But one team that we didn't really get a chance to touch on, one team that's been a real surprise, that's been led by one of the greatest stories that nobody's even talking enough about, in my opinion, is the Seattle Seahawks with Geno Smith. We're really before our eyes watching the career renaissance of Geno Smith as a quarterback in the latter stages of his career. It's one of the more fascinating storylines of the entire season. And you look at what he did on Sunday with Marquise Goodwin and the big plays that they had in a big win. They've really gone from being a nice little storyline after beating Russell Wilson in Seattle against the Broncos on Monday Night Football in the season opener back in week one to Geno Smith arguably currently playing at the level of a top 10 quarterback in the NFL right now with a roster in a division where nobody's running away from it. The NFC West, much like most of the NFL outside of maybe the top of the AFC West and the NFC East, there aren't really that many great divisions in the NFL right now. There are no real complete teams running away with this thing. Seattle's leading the NFC West with a real opportunity in front of them to make a playoff push. But based on production alone, Geno Smith is a top 10 quarterback in the league right now. Peter King wrote on Monday in his Football Morning in America column that Geno Smith could play his way into the MVP conversation. I mean, it's just nuts when you think about it, but that's the kind of year he's having. Some of these numbers, I mean, they just blow my mind right now. Geno Smith, after the Seahawks' first seven games, he's seventh in passing yards. He's sixth. He's in a tie for sixth place among NFL quarterbacks in passing touchdowns. He's seventh in completed air yards. So they're not just dinking and dunking down the field. You're seeing him connect with DK Metcalf on some deep balls. You're seeing him stretch the field with Tyler, Tyler Lockett. Geno Smith is having a career year. The Seahawks are in the mix. The Seahawks are a playoff team in large part because of the season that Geno Smith is having. And the only quarterbacks in the NFL right now with a higher passer rating than Geno Smith today, oh, you might have heard of them. It's Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allen. That's the company that Geno Smith is keeping. That's the rarefied air that Geno Smith and the Seahawks find themselves in, that the only two quarterbacks who have been more efficient with a better passer rating are Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allen. Then it's Geno Smith. If Smith keeps this up, he's going to get MVP votes. Peter King is dead on right about that, especially if the Seahawks keep throwing their weight around in the NFC West. And if he's playing at this level, they're going to. They might win a playoff game. I mean, you could see a wild card team going into that, that building against those fans with Smith playing at this level. You could see them knocking off a team in the playoffs. They're in a position, the Seahawks are, to make a playoff push and maybe even a playoff run because of Geno Smith's consistently strong play and the emergence of rookie running back Kenneth Walker, who's a star in the making. Just look what he did on Sunday afternoon. Who would have seen this coming when the Seahawks, you know, dealt Russell Wilson to the Broncos over the offseason? Who saw this? Everybody was talking about, was Drew Locke the answer? What are they going to do at quarterback? Should they draft a quarterback with all those draft picks they got in the Wilson trade? They might be riding with Geno. And Geno Smith has the opportunity to exact a little bit of revenge, as my producer Thomas Darrow reminded me of, on Sunday in Seattle against the New York Giants for how he got treated by Ben McAdoo after the whole debacle of the Eli Manning benching. Gino's playing at MVP level right now, and he has a chance to get some revenge against one of his former team. But from a quarterback who is punching above his weight, surpassing expectations, to one who looks like it might be one of the more disappointing surprises in the entire NFL. One of the biggest storylines of success in Seattle with one of the biggest disappointments in the league today, Tom Brady and the Buccaneers. Because after Sunday's disastrous, let's call it for what it is, that was an abject disaster in Charlotte on Sunday afternoon. A drubbing, a 21-3 to ass-kicking by the Carolina Panthers, whose front office, not 48 hours earlier, waved the white flag on the season, surrendered. They traded Robbie Anderson on Monday after 
everything that happened on the field in Arizona, the confrontations with the position coach. They traded Robbie Anderson away. But 48 hours before that game, they trade away Christian McCaffrey. They, 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 called, they waved the white flag on the season. And then they went out and they pounded Tom Brady and the Buccaneers. After that game, I've seen enough. I'm calling it right now. The Buccaneers have reached rock bottom. This is it. You know the scary part? The scary part for Tom Brady and the Buccaneers, even though this feels like rock bottom, and I think it is, it could still get way worse from there. It could still get way worse for them from here. Especially because everyone that I talk to inside the league is now convinced that Tom Brady is done. Now, I know that some of that might just be some teams and some people who have dealt with their fair share of losses to Tom Brady over the years that might have been knocked out of the postseason by Tom Brady and are jumping on the opportunity to dance on his grave. Scouts, coaches, personnel executives, everybody that I talk to, I can't find anyone to tell me that this is just a slump for Tom Brady. The thought is it's over. The thought is that this is it, that he's eroding before our eyes in real time. As Mike Garofalo from NFL Network tweeted at me on Sunday, it feels like he's declining in fast forward. But as one general manager told me, quote, father time is undefeated, end quote. That was his reaction to what we're seeing out of Tom Brady. Two weeks ago, I had a personnel executive tell me this is before what happened in Carolina that the Buccaneers are trying to, quote, hang on with Tom Brady, but they won't be able to because he is going south in a hurry, extremely quickly, unquote. Right now, when you look at the metric, the stat that general managers and coaches most judge quarterbacks by, how they view success from week to week and throughout a season in the NFL, it's yards per attempt. You know where Tom Brady and his 6.6 yards per attempt rank in the NFL? 15th, middle of the pack. Dead middle of the NFL, 15th in yards per attempt. Right now, he's not even a top-tier quarterback the way he's playing. And what's worse, as Albert Breer of Sports Illustrated points out, this isn't just a lack of production. This isn't just missing some throws here or there. This is the first time since 2002 that Tom Brady has been under 500 at this point in the season. And it isn't getting easier from here. They might be more competitive. They might not be as listless and flat and identityless as they were in Charlotte. But check out these next five weeks for Brady and the Bucks. Home on Thursday night against the Baltimore Ravens. I don't know there. Home against the Rams, defending Super Bowl champions with a lot to prove right in the thick of the NFC West race. Home against the Seattle Seahawks and Geno Smith. I would take Geno Smith today over Tom Brady in that game. One game one game to win today in 2022, the way Tom Brady's playing right now, I'd take Geno Smith. There is a very real possibility, very real possibility, that they limp into the bye week, the Buccaneers do at 3-7. and seven. And the second half, they got to play the 49ers. They got to play the Bengals. They got to play the Saints again. They got to play the Falcons, who, if that Grady Jarrett non roughing the passer, roughing the passer call isn't called, maybe that game goes differently. They got to play the Panthers again. Look, I'm not sure what Tom Brady was thinking coming back. I know that he's as competitive as it comes. He's the ultimate competitor that this sport has seen over the last 50 years. He's the most accomplished quarterback this sport and this league has ever seen. But I had a quarterback coach tell me last week that when veteran quarterbacks have one foot out the door or start thinking about, let alone talking about retirement, that's pretty much a wrap on their career. There's no real turning back from there. And Brady hasn't hinted that this will be his last season. We haven't heard anything like that. In fact, we've heard the opposite. When he steps to the podium in Tampa and says things like, there's no retirement in my future, it makes him think he might play till he's 60. I don't know that he's ever going to find the fountain of youth and play at the level that he did even a year ago when he was in the MVP conversation and he was an interception away from going to the NFC title game one year after winning his first Super Bowl in Tampa, his sixth, seventh of his career. It's really tough 
to imagine Tom Brady turning it around this season or returning to the Tom Brady that we've seen. This feels much more like the ending for Joe Montana in Kansas City than anything else. But another veteran quarterback who's drawn concern that his best days might be behind him. You heard Joe Banner hint at it just a little bit a few minutes ago. That's Aaron Rodgers. And I'm not so sure Aaron Rodgers is anywhere close to the Packers' biggest worry at this moment. They're just a team right now that doesn't have an identity. I don't really know what they do well. I don't really know what they do well right now. I think they're underachieving in all aspects. I think the offensive line got worse over the offseason. The, the running backs with A.J. Dillon and with Aaron Jones might be the calling card of what they are. They were kind of shut down on Sunday too. And Aaron Rodgers is still throwing catchable passes. He's thrown 11 touchdowns. So I don't know that this is all Aaron Rodgers' fault. The problem here is Green Bay really let Aaron Rodgers down this offseason. That front office and GM Brian Gutekunst completely miscalculated what losing Devontae Adams, trading him away to the Raiders, was going to do to that offense and how negatively it was going to impact Aaron Rodgers. Because Christian Watson and Romeo Dalbs, you know, Sunday afternoon, in a game that they were favored in and should have won, they combined for two catches. And if you're watching this, or if you're listening to this podcast right now, you, my friend, have as many catches as Romeo Dalbs did on Sunday afternoon against the Washington Commanders. You can't win that way. I don't care who your quarterback is. Aaron Rodgers is, by resume, a top two or three quarterback in the NFL, by production, a top 10 to 15 quarterback at worst in the NFL in 2022. But you can't even ask Aaron Rodgers to be effective under those conditions. And I asked the scouting director in the AFC if he thought Aaron Rodgers is shot. Is this a Tom Brady situation? Is this Matt Ryan? We saw what the Colts did. They corrected their misstep. We talked about it on the podcast a few weeks ago. You cannot build, you cannot drop a veteran quarterback into a roster that isn't tailor-made, a quarterback away, built to win a Super Bowl right now. The Colts tried to do it. It was a misstep, and they fixed it. They're benching him. They're going to Sam Ellinger, which is the right move. They called for it on Monday in the column. Didn't take long for Frank Reich to make the move. But I asked the scouting director if this is the same situation with Aaron Rodgers. Is he done? And he told me no. The Quote, the physical tools are still there. He's just grumpy and frustrated, unquote. If I were Aaron Rodgers, I'd be grumpy and frustrated too. I'd be pissed off too. I would be signaling to head coach Matt LaFleur in the media too that this offense needs to change. They need to figure something out. And they need to go and get a wide receiver at the deadline. Joe Banner, I think, is right on. I think the Jerry Judy name is a really fascinating one because he's a guy who's young with potential, could greatly benefit from a change of scenery getting out of Denver. And he's your second best receiving option with Watson and Daubs. You can round out a receiving core for the next five years with those three. You're set, you're done, whether it's Rodgers, Jordan Love, or player that you draft, quarterback you draft in the draft in 2024, whoever it is, you're set at that point. I think they make a run at Odell Beckham Jr. I wrote about this a month ago. I think that they are the betting line prohibitive favorites to go and get Odell Beckham Jr. Now, that's out of character for Green Bay. They don't typically overspend to bring in veteran free agents. I don't know that he's a, a culture fit for the Green Bay Packers. But what he does do is he wins. Odell Beckham Jr., you saw it with the Rams. He wins. You put him in the right situation with the right quarterback, the right support system which the Packers have, he delivers because he's still going to give you one or two take the top off of defense snaps per game. He's still going to be a difference maker in the passing game for as many games as he's on the field for. And I know that Odell Beckham Jr. wants to go somewhere where he can catch a lot of balls, play with an elite quarterback, and have a chance to win a Super Bowl. The Packers are one of those few situations, one of those few teams that offer all three. Who else is the MVP? Who else is the quarterback? Maybe the Chiefs or the Bills go get a luxury item, but I don't think either one of those teams needs Odell Beckham Jr. 
But if they get him, Joe Banner was right. Prohibitive Super Bowl favorites. But I would not be surprised if Chase Claypool winds up there, if Jerry Judy winds up there. Maybe the Packers even make a call to the Jets on Elijah Moore, but I don't know that he offers them the same upside right here, right now. The bottom line is they need wide receiver help, whoever it is. As one executive told me, Christian Watson and Romeo Dalbs, quote, they may be able to win with those receivers someday. Not today. And I think we're seeing that. I think Aaron Rodgers sees that. They don't have an identity. The defense is underperformed. The offensive line has taken a step back. They've been a colossal disappointment. I thought they were a legitimate Super Bowl contender in the NFC. They're going to struggle to win that division. They really are. When you look at the NFC, you have to look at the Philadelphia Eagles. The Seahawks are in the mix. Maybe the Minnesota Vikings. Maybe the Dallas Cowboys. Giants, Rams, 49ers. I think all of those teams are better positioned right now for this year and with brighter futures than Green Bay has. I think Green Bay is in trouble. I think the Packers are in real trouble here. And they need to make some big moves at the deadline, which would be a step out of character for that front office. And man, there is hot, a really bad football being played in this league right now, don't you think? I was on the phone with a quarterback coach last week. We talked for an hour. And there is just some really bad teams, some awful quarterback play, some terrible coaching. It's a problem. I know the NFL is designed with parity in mind and the thought that any given team can beat anyone else on any given Sunday. But but who would you say are the elite teams and playing at an elite level in the NFL today? Of course, you have the Bills and Chiefs. You have the Eagles. And who else? We're seven weeks into the season. There's one undefeated team left. The Bills and Chiefs look like they're on a collision course for the AFC title game. Who challenges them? Who would even be a threat to upset them in the postseason? Who beats the Eagles? When's that first loss coming? Maybe in Dallas, if that defense plays plays above its head. But this has been one of the more disappointing, awfully played NFL seasons that I can really remember in half a decade or more. But it's not all awful. There are some surprises. And the biggest, most pleasant surprise of all, it might be the New York Giants. Brian Dable's New York football Giants, they just continue to find ways to win. And they don't have a great roster, but you know what they do have? They have a winning formula. They're winning by using Saquon Barkley as a battering ram in the fourth quarter which is exactly when defensive coordinator Wink Martindale tightens the screws, dials up the pressure, and even if they're trailing by 3.7 points, it doesn't matter. That defense is making timely plays, picking up timely turnovers, and when they give the ball back to the offense, they're just giving you a healthy dose of Saquon Barkley. And you know what? It is smart. Brian Dable has done the smartest thing that any Giants coach has done Since 2018, since Pat Shermer, since Joe Judge, he has found a way to maximize Saquon Barkley as a weapon. Because here's the deal. You have a six foot, 230 pound running back who can squat like a thousand pounds, whatever it is. Not a guy who gets tired. You have a guy who gets stronger as the game goes along. He's just as explosive as he is elusive in the open field. And his defenses are getting tired in the fourth quarter when games are winding down, you just pound the rock over and over and over again with Saquon Barkley, and you wear teams down. That's what they're doing. I wrote about this in First and Ten on Monday, but how Brian Dable and the Giants are using Saquon Barkley right now, it's smart for exactly where this team is in its development, and they're getting the dividends from it. They really are. Over the past four weeks, Barkley's amassed 72 rushing yards, 26 yards and a touchdown, two rushing yards and a touchdown, and 43 yards over the fourth quarter of the past four games. Barkley's production in the ground game in the fourth quarter, it accounts for 35% of his rushing yards over that stretch. That's unbelievable. They're just keeping him fresh, rotating the other guys in, 
using him out of the backfield as a receiver earlier in the game. And then when the game gets tight in the fourth quarter, turn him loose. That's how the Giants are winning. Because this is a team with a roster that has no business competing. I mean, for crying out loud, Marcus Johnson is one of their starting wide receivers. They're banged up all over the place. Daniel Bellinger, their tight end, one of their feel-good stories, one of their emerging offensive weapons, he's out now for several weeks with a, a, a ruptured eye socket. They're banged up along the offensive line. Dexter Lawrence and Leonard Williams are nice players, but they don't have a dominant defensive line. They have a really good pass rush with Aziz Ojolari, who's been in and out. He's been banged up. Kayvon Thibodeau is emerging. But on offense, Daniel Jones isn't that accurate of a quarterback. But what they do have, what the Giants do have, and it's delivering wins for them, is a swarming defense with a mad scientist defensive coordinator who will blitz the house at you regardless, all game long. Be disruptive, especially in big spots. And you have a team that's all in, and I mean all in, on Brian Dable, his aggressiveness in big spots at the end of games and fourth downs, aggressive play calling, and with Mike Kafka and Brian Dable putting together a scheme that really maximizes what their players are, not just Saquon. Daniel Jones rushed for 100 yards on Sunday. Daniel Jones, they've figured out that he's at his best using the play-action game and rolling out of the pocket. And they're doing it with great success pretty early often. They're building a scheme around their players' strengths, not shoehorning their players into a system, which is the ultimate fallacy, and it trips up so many coaches along the way. But you look at what they're doing, the Giants are 6-1. and one. And you look at the schedule in front of them, they're going to mess around and make the playoffs. They might not win the division because they think the Eagles are too good. But they're a team that could play spoiler. They're a team that could win a game as a wild card. Here's their next five weeks. After they go to Seattle on Sunday and have the bye, worst case, they're 6-2. and two. Worst case. Maybe you pull off an upset and you're 7-1 and one and you're really feeling yourself going into that bye week. But listen to this run. The Houston Texans at home. The Detroit Lions at home. At the Cowboys. You have the Commanders, the Eagles, the Commanders again. At Minnesota. The Colts at home. And then they finish up at Philly. Worst case scenario. I'm talking worst case. And I'm, and this isn't Daniel Jones getting hurt and Saquon Barkley going down and the wheels coming off. But in a regular stretch run here, the Giants are 10-7. and seven. In the NFC, 10-7 and seven gets you the first wild card spot. Because that conference is wide open. Nobody's running away from you there. And the bottom line is, that this may be the best first-year head coaching performance in NFL history, bar none. And Brian Dable really should run away with the NFL Coach of the Year award. I was wrong about the Giants. I admit it. I thought they were a four-win team at most. And looking at the roster, that's probably what they are. But I didn't count on this. I didn't count on Brian Dable being the best part of Bill Parcells and Vince Lombardi and Bill Belichick, all at one and getting his players to buy in completely. A lot of people were wrong. Go back and read the preseason predictions on the Giants. A lot of people got this team wrong. By the roster that was left behind by Dave Gettleman and new GM Joe Shane kind of just piecemealing it together over this offseason, not wanting to sacrifice future draft picks, not wanting to commit future cap space to this team. This team had no business competing. But just imagine in 2023, where Brian Dable, Wink Martindale, and this team is going to be when Joe Shane gives them the players that they need to compete, the players that fit their vision for their scheme with the draft picks and the cap space they have to do it. If they get the quarterback position right, look out for the Giants. All right, let's hand out the Lombardo Trophy, should we? This week for week seven, it was an easy one. It's Bengals quarterback Joe Burrow taking home the Lombardo Trophy. And listen, if you followed me through the years, you know how all in, how bullish I am 
on Joe Burrow because I think he's a top three quarterback in the NFL. If I were starting a team, he'd probably be my third pick behind Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allen. But I think his ceiling is higher than either one of those guys. And I think he has the best chance, Joe Burrow does, of this generation of quarterbacks to launch a Tom Brady-type career, especially as long as he has Jamar Chase, especially as long as Zach Taylor is his head coach. Because if anyone started to get skeptical about Burrow and his start to the beginning of this season, and he had plenty of reason to be after what happened in Dallas, after what happened in the opener and the turnover fest against the Pittsburgh Steelers and that overtime loss at home, But if you started to get skeptical about Joe Burrow or his upside or what the Bengals are, well, Sunday was a pretty nice reminder of what the Bengals are and how high Joe Burrow's ceiling is. Check out this stat line. 481 yards and three touchdown passes. More importantly, no interceptions. And he also rushed for 20 yards and a touchdown against the Falcons. 500 total yards, four total touchdowns. That's a winning formula. That's the kind of performance that wins you not one, but multiple Super Bowls. The past two weeks, Joe Burrow has passed for 781 yards and six touchdowns. Here's the kicker. Here's what's most important. Over those last two games, both Bengals wins, one on the road, one at home, Joe Burrow hasn't tossed an interception. Joe Burrow, to me, of all the quarterbacks, Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen, Joe Burrow, Justin Herbert, Jalen Hurts, Joe Burrow has the best chance to be the next Tom Brady. He's Peyton Manning from a tactician standpoint, pre-snap and post-snap, goes through his reads extremely quickly. And he's Brady from a competitive drive perspective. The, The dude just has it. He has all the tools. There's elite weapons around him in a system that's built for success. And I had a conversation with an offensive coach who told me the merit of a quarterback can be based on his completion percentage and his interception percentage, that when you're judging quarterback prospects coming out from the draft, when you're looking at how much you should pay an NFL quarterback on his first contract extension, you look at two metrics, interception percentage and completion percentage. Joe Burrow's completion percentage this season, 68.9. Right up there, top 10 in the league. His interception percentage, he's thrown an interception on less than 2% of his dropbacks, less than 2% of his throws. He protects the football. He processes information and dictates to opposing defenses at an insane level. And he has a top three receiving core with Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, and Tyler Boyd, and a great running back. Burrow showed what makes him a lead against the Falcons on Sunday, and if he keeps that up, the Bengals are going to have something to say about the AFC. They're going to have something to say come playoff time, and they're going to have something to say about the race in the AFC North. I know they're kind of coming from behind now against the Ravens after losing that game in prime time. But if Burrow keeps this up, the Bengals are going to be a really tough team to beat. Finally, let's go to the pick of the week. We got to bounce back here because after giving away the Giants in London, we've got two straight losses. You know who else has to turn things around? The Jacksonville Jaguars, they've now lost four straight games, somewhat inexplicably, really. They're they're two-and-a-half-point home favorites against the Broncos, who have also lost four in a row. So something really has to give here. And the biggest difference to me is Nathaniel Hackett is in way over his head as a head coach. Russell Wilson is banged up. Broncos GM George Payton is about to throw an everything-must-go sign in front of Mile High Stadium. And with the front office in Denver telegraphing a potential Bradley Chubb blockbuster trade, making KJ Hamler available via a deal, maybe Jerry Judy, then tearing it all down after committing $166 million guaranteed to Russell Wilson, there might not be a worse situation or a more mismanaged franchise right now than the Denver Broncos. The bottom line here is the Jaguars are the better coach team. Trevor Lawrence is coming off his first 300-plus yard game of the season, and I think he'll be able to do enough to eke out a low-scoring game. I like the Jaguars as my pick of the pick of the week. We go for covers. We go for covers here. And I like the Jaguars as my pick of the week, beating the Broncos 17-10. to And we're going to have a little bit of fun. We're going to do something different here. If you're riding with me on the pick of the week, if you're taking the Jaguars with the points over the Denver Broncos, Screenshot your betting slips. 
tweet them to me at Matt Lombardo NFL, and we'll shout you out on next podcast. We'll mention you on the show next week for joining the pick of the week train. So let's have some, have some fun together. Let's make some money together with the pick of the week. What a great show this has been. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you to Joe Banner from the 33rd team. Fantastic insight from Joe. Follow him on Twitter at Joe Banner 13. Really enjoyed the conversation there. You can follow me on Twitter at Matt Lombardo NFL. You can follow Heavy on Twitter at Heavy on Sports. And if you enjoyed the podcast, please go ahead and subscribe in the Apple Podcast Store, Spotify, SoundCloud, YouTube, all your favorite podcast platforms, and drop those five-star reviews in the Apple Podcast Store. They really help grow the show, and I would really love to hear what you think of the pod, some guests you might want to have on, and we'll read those on the show in coming weeks. Thanks to our producer, Thomas Darrow, who does a tremendous job putting this show together each and every week. He's instrumental to the success I'm Matt Lombardo. Enjoy the games this week. I'll talk to you next week right here on the Matt Lombardo Show presented by Heavy.